One of the things that the Mushoku Tensei novels like to do is switch between the perspective of who we're following throughout the story. It's quite often that we're given a break from Rudy and his travels and are instead shown what's happening with some of the different characters. So, when last episode had a major focus on Paul, there was a whole bunch of backstory given which helped to support his own point of view. Stuff that may help you understand why exactly it is he expected so much from Rudy in the first place. So, let's do as we usually do and take a look at what the anime missed from the novels. Let's get started. Episode 17, Reunion, covering chapters 2-6 to six of Volume 5 of the Light Novel. Starting things off just moments after Paul's teleportation, we find out the place he was sent to was actually somewhat familiar to him. It was a remote area just south of the Asuran Kingdom where he'd once spent a couple years learning the Water God style, a place he remembered as Lilia's hometown. This wasn't somewhere he was entirely fond of, but it did bring back all the memories of how his training went. The senior students were a pack of arrogant fools who couldn't even surpass the beginner rank, and the master himself was no more than the advanced level. So, whenever these seniors would try to boss him around for being new, it would always sting since that's the very reason he ran away from home in the first place. Especially since he knew he was already a better swordsman than them. When it got to the point where Paul just couldn't put up with it anymore, Rather than show them how much better he was with his sword, he instead decided to spite them a different way. You see, the night he ran away he made sure to sleep with Lilia first. Not because he liked her in any way in particular, but more so because he just wanted to make a mess of something that they treasured. So that's exactly what he ended up doing. Now, once those memories resided, it was the warm touch of Norn that brought him back to reality. She was the sole reason why he could no longer dismiss this as just a dream now. The reason she was even with him at all though was simply due to a chance occurrence of him giving her a hug at the time of teleportation. He was just having a casual conversation with Zenith, all while Lilia and Aisha were doing lessons on the other side of the room. Now, Aisha wasn't as gifted as Rydius, but she was definitely growing up much faster than Norn was. Lilia's constant lessons allowed a lot of what she was teaching to just stick, making Paul feel as if there could be something wrong with Norn. Of course, Norn was just a perfectly normal child, but the fact that she was going to grow up in the shadow of two exceedingly bright siblings did make Paul feel a bit bad for her. In any case, what Paul had experienced to get here was something that felt resoundingly similar to a common yet dangerous labyrinth trap. A teleportation trap that instantly transported him and anyone he was in contact with to a different location. Because of the way it split up the party, it was one of the most severe traps that every adventurer knew to look out for. There were countless stories of veteran parties meeting their end because of them. So, with this undoubtedly being some sort of teleportation, the next question to figure out was why. There was certainly no shortage of people who would want to launch a sneak attack on Paul, but teleportation just didn't make sense for one. For starters, there isn't any known incantation for it. In order for teleportation to work, the caster would need to use either a magic circle or a specialized magic item, one of which is forbidden and the other banned. So, for someone to go to such extreme and dangerous lengths just for revenge? Well, that definitely wasn't likely. But still, Paul couldn't help but think that perhaps it could be that. Perhaps one of his past acquaintances from training was finally getting back at him. Regardless of what that reason may be, the only thing that mattered now was getting home. A feat that wouldn't have been possible if not for the very cautious nature of Paul as a person. You see, not only did he always carry his sword just in case, but he also kept with it his adventurer card and a single gold coin, specifically for an emergency just like this one. So, after heading into town, he immediately found the guild, split his coin into change, then finessed himself a horse through quite the ingenious method. Something that was only possible due to two very important factors. Because Paul was a registered S-rank adventurer, that meant that he was eligible for special S-rank privileges one of which was the provision of a horse whenever an urgent delivery job was taken. While normally this would be a quest reserved for those of the E rank or lower, the urgent aspect of it meant that anyone could take it. So Paul accepted this quest just so he could gain access to the horse that came with it. Of course, the guild was expecting the horse back upon the job's completion, but Paul never intended to complete the job in the first place. If it meant that he was able to get home faster, then he was willing to accept any punishment the guild would give him after the fact. Now, the reason Norn had gotten sick was mainly due to the fact that Paul rarely ever stopped. Regardless of whether it was day or night, Paul made sure to keep moving forward through all of it. It was a strenuous expedition that Norn simply couldn't keep up with, resulting in her getting sick right in the middle of it. Since that forced Paul to stop to nurse her back to health, 
the entire journey ended up taking two months in total. So, despite him trying to get back home as fast as possible, the time it took to help Norn meant that he might as well have taken a carriage right from the get-go. At least that way Norn wouldn't have gotten sick. But anyway, once Paul had come to see the true gravity of the entire situation, that's when he began to fear for the safety of his family. Zenith could probably handle herself since she was a former adventurer, but Aisha and Lilia were completely different. Yes, Lilia did know how to use a sword, but ever since the incident with the poison, she wasn't quite as good as she used to be. Plus, unless Lilia was holding Aisha at the time of teleportation, then there was no way to know for sure if the two were even teleported together. So, Paul could only hope that the two were at least holding hands. Switching back to his arrival at Fatoa, the person we see here was actually a butler of Philip's. A loyal servant to the Boreas Grey Rat family, as well as the sole person responsible for setting up this entire refugee camp. The reason he'd approached Paul at all was mainly to see if he could help in supporting the refugees. You see, despite being completely aware of Paul's less than ideal traits, he was also aware that Paul was extremely reliable in times of crisis. Combine this with the fact that he was the man who raised Rudy, and that was enough for Alphonse to believe that he could trust him. Apparently, Rudy had said quite a few good things about Paul during his time at the mansion. So, with the help of Alphonse's numerous connections, Paul was able to set up a fully functional refugee camp complete with several workers and a rescue squad. They then set out to the country of Millicent and began to scout the entire continent. While the first six months were rather productive, Paul never was able to achieve his primary objective of finding his own family. But what we didn't get to see in the anime was how he was able to use his relation to Zenith as an advantage. You see, Zenith just so happened to come from a noble house with quite a bit of influence in Millis. They were a family well known for producing famous knights amongst other things. So, with ties to noble lineage, Paul was able to use that to start freeing many of the slaves that he found. Any slave that couldn't be bought with goods or gold was instead pressured by Zenith's family to consider otherwise. If there came a time when that didn't work though, that's when Paul and his crew would be forced to resort to kidnapping, resulting in many of the other nobles starting to send their own forces after him. Even so, both this connection to nobility and his status as an adventurer still wasn't enough to locate the people that he really wanted. Then, by the time a year had passed, most stranded Fatoans in Millis had been located and were actively being freed if they were stuck in slavery. There was still the occasional person who would be found in a remote village far from the main city, but most news was now about dead Fatoans rather than live ones. So, it seemed as if Paul's operation was getting close to its end now. They did manage to save several thousand refugees, but that still didn't make up for those he couldn't find and those who were already lost. Combine that with several people who blame him for taking too long to find their family, and the end result is the Paul that we see in the anime. After another six months, the whole operation was now shifting from search and rescue to escort missions. With very little Fatoans left to be found, many of Paul's group were better used to escort the women, children, and elderly back to the Asura Kingdom. The search and rescue squad was still kept active, but the entire thing was planned to end in only another six months. Two years was the longest that anyone was willing to keep funding them. Not only was it far too expensive to keep it going, but the amount of planning and logistics needed to comb the countryside simply wasn't achievable with their current group of people. Especially with Paul being in the state that he was in now. With that being everything that happened to Paul, we can now move on to his post-fight conversation with Geese. As we know from last episode, Geese was a former member of the Black Wolf Fangs who was kind of discreetly helping him. He did get in touch with Paul prior to leaving for Zantport, but he never did confirm that he was going to search for his family. All they did was have a few brief conversations before Geese just randomly disappearing one day. So, for him to show up now almost one year later, well, that was quite the shock considering his abrupt departure last time. Now, when we get to their conversation, most of it was pretty much the same, but there was a bit more that can be shown from Paul's perspective. You see, one of the main reasons why Paul felt he could expect so much from Rudy was partly because of the fight they'd just had yesterday. Yes, Paul was a little drunk during the encounter, but he couldn't deny that he was going all out the entire time. So, the fact that he was only able to slice the panties off of Rudy's face was more than enough proof to indicate that Rudy was now stronger than he was. Not only did he remain untouched the entire fight, but it was clear that he wasn't even trying like how all the others were. That much was obvious when he found out none of his people suffered more than minor injuries. So, with Paul seeing Rudy as both smarter and stronger than him now, he couldn't help but feel like there was nothing wrong in expecting more out of him. 
To him, age was irrelevant when it came to a person's capabilities. Now, another factor that helped to influence this mindset was a message from Glaine herself that stated that she didn't even think that she could beat Rudeus. You see, back when she saw him fend off those kidnappers in Episode 5, Ghislaine believed that if Rudy was given enough range, then there was no way she'd ever be able to safely close the gap on him. So, if the Sword King Ghislaine wasn't able to beat Rudeus given the right conditions, then that meant there were likely less than 1,000 people worldwide who could do it either. It was yet another aspect of Rudy that Paul thought made up for his lack of real-world experience. Besides, when talking about the realm of prodigies, you have people like the second North God who was able to beat a Sword Emperor during his first fight. That being the case, Paul truly didn't believe that he was expecting too much, especially since Rudy also had a spurt protecting him. What Paul failed to see about this spurt factor, though, was the arduous circumstances under which it happened. I mean, it's not like Rudy automatically knew exactly what Rudyard wanted right from the get-go. He was, after all, just a stranger. So, when encountered with a powerful person whose intentions are vague at best, what better option to choose than to get on their good side? This was what Geese was trying to explain. Rudy helping Rudyard was the safest path he could have chosen. Not only did it guarantee his safety throughout the Demon Continent, but it also gave him the opportunity to learn new skills from a very powerful instructor. There was no benefit in risking anything else. And that was the aspect of the spurt factor that Paul was failing to consider. Now, if Rudy was able to comb the continent along with everything else that he did, then Geese straight up said that he was ready to give the kid a spot in the Seven Great Powers. That may have been a joke to Geese, but Paul truly felt that Rudy had the raw talent to make it there. And that wasn't just his parental pride speaking. In any case, when the picture was painted like that, that's when Paul finally started to reconsider things. What really got him going, though, was the whole explanation of why Rudy didn't see his message in the first place. It's not like Geese knew all the details himself, but he was able to explain what had happened during his time with the Doldia tribe. So, eventually, Paul was able to conclude that something had happened before Rudy could even get to Zandport, something that resulted in him getting taken prisoner by the Doldia. As for how Geese was able to find Rudy, well, he had actually been scouring the Great Forest for any lost humans when he had come across some information that one was locked up by the Doldia. Then, by using his connection with the local warriors, he was able to get himself tossed into the same jail cell as them, the plan being to help the kid escape and make it back to Millis. Of course, Geese was expecting to find a sobbing snot-nosed brat, but instead what he found was infinitely better. A couple interactions was all it took for Geese to realize that this was Paul's kid. His casual demeanor and absolute confidence was more than enough proof to indicate it. While Paul was shocked to hear how the two had met, what he really wanted to know was why Geese just didn't explain everything to Rudeus while he was there. A question Geese quickly avoided by switching the topic then leaving, bringing us back to what we saw in the anime. It was shortly after this conversation, though, that Viera had showed up in an outfit much less provocative than her normal one. Reason being that she currently felt like what had happened may have been her fault. She couldn't help but think that perhaps her outfit may have caused Rudy to misunderstand the nature of their relationship. So, with this being the topic of conversation, that's when we get to learn why it is Viera wears such revealing armor in the first place. You see, back when the displacement incident had happened, Viera was captured by a gang of bandits who then treated her as a plaything. Even with having some skills as an adventurer, her lack of equipment meant she simply couldn't defend herself. So, it was a hellish nightmare that you'd expect to leave trauma on anyone. But much to Paul's surprise, the time it took for her to bounce back after being rescued was surprisingly fast. Viera was somehow able to put these unspeakable events behind her. Unfortunately for her sister Shiera, though, she didn't seem to have the willpower to do the same. Because she too went through a similar situation, just the eye contact of a man was enough to make her tremble uncontrollably. So, in order to protect her sister from any unwanted attention, Viera started to wear this skimpy armor to focus all that attention on her. Not only protecting her sister from her past trauma, but also every other woman who was subjected to the same. She was truly an indispensable part of Paul's team. Now, it was after this that pretty much everything else was identical to the novels. Rudy and Paul were able to make up, then the group spent a week doing things around the city. There was quite a bit of content regarding what happened during that week, but that's something I'll have to cover if I have time after Anime NYC. But yeah, that's pretty much it for this week's Mushoku Tensei episode. Since I'm going to be in New York for the next 7 days though, I don't think I'll be able to put up a video next week. So, you can expect the next Mushoku Tensei video in approximately 14 days. But anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!